Yes. Yes. This, this is what? Yeah. Uh, we have just started the live uh, session. Uh, the link that we had sent to you, I mean, this there can be only one live session. So, uh, though, so that was meant to be a reminder. So you should just log in again to the Lex Campus channel, and you should be able to listen to us. Yeah. Uh, in, in fact, uh, my colleagues will be posting a message yes. on the uh, on the dif different forums just to let you know that you know the link. The live link is we are, we are live on a different uh, on a different uh, on a different track. Now uh, we before we start this. Now the scope of this lecture is to consider the recent decision of the Supreme Court in Monsanto's case, and it turned out to be uh, slightly different from what people were expecting. Case was argued in length. And uh, they were expecting a very detailed order on whether genes can be or nucleic acid sequences can be patentable. Where is this coming from? Okay. Um, um, my apologies. Apologies, uh, something was playing at the back because n normally when you open YouTube, <laughs> so many things can happen at the same time. Now, now, so this decision, we, are, we were expecting. Uh, Sir, yeah, now, now it's fine. Sir, currently only three has joined. Okay. Okay. Should we give them some time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Until, yeah. until people yeah, reach yeah, to us. Yeah, yeah. Because currently only three are watching now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, b because there is a change in the link that we had sent, we would uh, just hold on for a few more minutes before we go, before we start the class. We have to reroute people from the Yeah, 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 understood, yeah. Okay, uh, by the time people come in, we will just uh, give a brief backdrop of how this case came into being. There was an infringement case suit that was filed by Monsanto against uh, Nuzi Vido Seeds. And this uh, a decision in of which was given in uh, 2017. And there was no order passed on, there was no uh, interim order passed, there was only directions passed on the uh, with regard to the two parties what they should do that order was taken up in appeal before the division bench the division bench initially heard arguments from both the sides and then the division bench found that there could be a threshold issue now threshold issue could be with regard to jurisdiction it could be with regard to maintainability the court felt that there is a threshold issue that can be considered and the court offered it to both the parties and the both the parties agreed that yes let's consider the threshold issue and the court goes on to decide only the threshold issue when the court decided the threshold issue the threshold issue itself was to see whether the patents act is applicable for the particular invention so the court held that the patent act is not the applicable act it had to hold that it wouldn't come within the purview of the patents act and it goes on to hold that it will come under the purview of the plant varieties act so the threshold issue turned out to be the tricky point so there was an appeal before the supreme court and the effect of the deciding the threshold issue was that uh, monsanto would not be granted a patent under the patent regime so when the matter came up before the supreme court Arguments were advanced at length, which is captured in the Supreme Court's order, a summary of which. And the Supreme Court uh, did not give an, uh, a, a decision on merits. Rather, it said that the division bench taking this approach of deciding a threshold issue was uh, amounted to a summary disposal without trial. And it remanded the case back, not to the division bench, but to the single judge so this is what has happened there was a single bench decision on an interim issue the monsanto had asked for an interim injunction which was not granted but directions were passed 
that matter went to appeal before the division bench a bench comprising of two high court judges and there the parties felt and the court also felt that there could be a threshold issue to be decided a threshold as i said it could be a issue with regard to jurisdiction it could be an issue with regard to maintainability and the court went forward getting the consent of the parties to decide the threshold issue now when the threshold issue came up before the supreme court the supreme court has now held that the court's decision or, or the way in which the court decided the threshold issue was incorrect and it has remanded the case back to the uh, single judge now 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 let's just look at before we understand this order this order is not a uh, um a uh, detail i mean it's not as detailed as the other two orders the single bench and the um and the division uh, single judge and the division bench order uh, this is just 27 odd pages but before we come to this we have to look at the first order that was passed by justice r k goba we will just bring up the first order to you yes so what you will find uh, this is a typical infringement case there uh, was an infringement uh, allegation comprising not just patents but also trademarks which was filed by monsanto against nuzi v2 seeds huh? so i'm not able to see the screen this is there is a slight lag so we are just waiting for the correct case to come up Okay, we are having a small issue with regard to showing the document hold on We are, uh, we are not able to show the document to you. please uh, please hold on we are just trying another way to bring that back so we do see okay it it uh, the, the the document will now appear before you now just to tell you that this case was a typical infringement case wherein we had we we had um, uh, monsanto Uh, filing a case against uh, nuzi v2 seeds now th in this order i'll just quickly take you through the relevant parts now you will find that uh, before proceed th this the judge notes the single judge notes that before proceeding further it is to be noted that the defendant submitted two counter claims so counter claim is where when there is a claim made by the plaintiff on infringement 
the defendant can make a claim against the plaintiff so that acts as a separate suit in itself so it's numbered separately now you will notice here that one counter claim cc 50 of 2016 so they are numbered separately they are treated as a separate suit so no see we do raised a counter claim stating that uh, the declaration of sub licensing agreements which were terminated by monsanto would be valid binding and be in force so that was one declaration that they were asking for by way of a counter claim and the second one was a counter claim under section 64 and you would remember that section 64 has a provision where you can make a counter claim on the point that in an infringement suit you can take revocation as a defense so section 64 the the way in which you do it is through section uh, 107 so 107 allows you to take counter claim uh, or the grounds of revocation as a counter claim in an infringement suit so there were two counter claims and you will note here that the counter claim on 64 was the one that uh was the second counter claim that nuzi vidu had raised and you will further find that the counter claim uh had been uh the the there was only uh though the counter claim was filed a notice was issued on this counter claim you will find this later and uh, the other side that is monsanto had not replied on this counter claim now that's a procedural or a technical thing that you need to bear in mind because uh the facts that happened in the single judge had a bearing on the decision of the supreme court so the counter claim was filed notice was issued but monsanto had not replied back to it you know that's a relevant fact so we'll come back to it uh, later so the judge states the challenge before this court is to uh, see whether the prayer of ad interim injunction uh, can be granted and and the court feels that that it does it, an order has to be subject to the scrutiny of pleadings of the parties in the light of the document relied upon by both the sides the legal findings emanating from such exercise being incomplete possibly open to debate as much as it would the advantage of formal proof particularly expert opinion the court just says that it's very hard to decide a matter in the interim stage without the pleadings being completed without the proof being adduced and without expert opinion being adduced in in matters uh, complicated matters like a patent in this case so so this is again one thing that the judge finds and further down you will find that uh the court notes that it must be noted that at this stage the counter claim that's the second counter claim on revocation which has been pressed by the defendants to seek revocation uh the the court considered that to say that the defendants had raised various grounds you know that 64 has multiple grounds ground of novelty ground of obviousness it also included this ground complete specification not revealing any invention that is section 64 1d uh 1d we know that section 64 1d is the provision through which you can bring in all the arguments under section 3 and 4 so if you have an argument to be raised under section 3 and 4 you would do that through section 64 1d so as expected uh the argument on section 3j which was the main argument in both the revision bench and in the supreme court was brought in through this ground and the court uh, further states that whether or not the suit patent is liable to be revoked on the aforesaid grounds under 64 is a question that needs to be addressed at the appropriate stage only after pleadings in that regard are complete and evidence is adduced no comment at this stage on such aspect of the dispute is called for so the court clearly the single judge clearly steers away from deciding whether the counter claim has to be considered at this point and whether all the grounds raised in the uh, counter claim needs to be considered and also whether that you cannot consider th- this without pleadings being completed and without ed- evidence being adduced now that's the view the single ju- uh, judge has taken and which has a bearing because uh, we have to make a i mean uh, towards the end i'll tell you uh, that there are issues that can be decided only in trial you need complete sheet of pleadings and you also need yeah the issues that can be completed only after trial and after the completion of pleadings and pleadings are the argument uh, are the petitions filed by both the parties the plaintiffs 
pleading uh, the 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 plaint and the written statement and in this case you have to include the counter claim and the counter to the counter claim so the written arguments or the written statements and the evidence adduced together form the pleading trial is when the evidence is put to examination there is an examination in chief followed by cross examination and a re examination if any and then the argument so trial is where the the, the pleadings are tested through evidence and arguments are proffered so the court feels that without trial which includes looking at the pleadings and the evidence that is put forward we cannot come to a conclusion as to whether there is a case for a counter claim so this is what the single judge holds uh the counter claim uh the arguments of the defendant that technology of the, had been wrongly patented in india so this is the point that it was wrongly patented in india and it uh, runs foul of the plant varieties act that was another thing they said and the court said that does not impress and the court moves forward and the court agrees now in 105 the single judge says that this court agrees with the submission of the plaintiff that section 3j of the patents act as noted above cannot be interpreted without taking into effect the changes of section 21j and section 5 as to deprive the patentee of a due re uh, reward of human skill or ingenuity resulting in human intervention and innovations over and above what occurs in nature it is admitted case of the defendants that claims 25 to 27 under the suit patent involve laboratory process and are not naturally occurring substances and uh, they say by uh, an exclude and are to be only which are to be excluded within the purview of section 3 now section 3 the court does consider because if you see the earlier paragraphs there is some discussion on section 3 and and the court just quickly says that section 3j is specifically not applicable in the way in which uh, the defendants have interpreted it and it agrees with the arguments proffered by the plaintiff so there is some discussion we will come back to this in detail later there is some discussion on section 3j and finally the court issues directions they don't injunct nozi vidu that's important to know they just pass a direction wherein they say that the sub license agreement should be put into effect meaning which monsanto and nozi vidu will be in the relationship of a, a licensor and a licensee and it gives on what terms they have to fulfill it the plaintiff shall do so many things the defendant shall so it is more like a license that the court has evolved and and finally the court says that in default the default if any by the defendants in strict compliance with the above direction would render them disentitled to the continued use of the suit patents and trademarks of the plaintiff consequent thereupon in such event they would stand injuncted against the use of the patent and trademarks so there was no injunction per se but the court said that if you don't comply with these directions then you could be injuncted from using the patents and the trademark so the court in effect gives certain directions the court does not pass an injunction there is no uh, and the court also does not say anything upon the validity of the patent now this is what happened in the first case that is before the division bench now let's just see what happened before the sorry th this is what happened before the single judge now let's pull up the order of the court before the division bench yes um now before the division bench uh, it's interesting to note that you know some of these cases as the case goes by uh, as the case goes by the the script and the way in which it is argued may change a bit so you may not expect what happened in the uh, single 
before the single judge to happen exactly in that same matter. It's not just those issues. Certain other refinements may happen in the course of the case. Now, here this was uh, an order that was delivered by Justice Ravindra Bhatt. And uh, the court notes at the outset that okay okay uh, the court notes here the reason why Monsanto appealed now Monsanto appeals the judgment of the learned single judge which directed it to continue supplying BT content transgenic variety under the sub license agreement for a fee so that is the reason they appealed and Nuzi Vidu also filed an appeal stating that it cannot the order cannot be sustained that the order cannot be sustained as it is excluded subject matter under section 3j of the patents act so they raise a threshold issue and the court considers whether the suit pattern that is pattern number 214436 falls within the scope of the patents act or the plant varieties act the court considers this as a threshold issue so, so you will find that where the three courts differed the supreme court uh, sided with the single judge and the division bench took a different view was not with regard to whether there should be a summary trial or not but with regard to whether you can consider the fact that whether the applicable act is patents act or whether it is the plant varieties act whether that can be considered as a threshold issue so the court and we'll we'll find here that uh, Monsanto had sought for an interim injunction and uh, but they were not granted that interim injunction and they were the argument was that what the single judge did amounted to a compulsory license okay so uh, so the learned single judge by the impugned judgment held that New Zealand companies cannot be injuncted against the use of the suit patents and trademarks and they were allowed to use so so this was allowed now the directions that you saw in the single judge's order is reproduced here so this is monsanto's argument the monsanto is aggrieved because monsanto considers that directions to act as a compulsory license so it's a court implemented compulsory license i complain of infringement and the court says that abide by these directions and let them continue to use it so it's a coast court instituted license so they call it the compulsory license so this was the uh, and and news we do's argument in appeal was that the conclusions are wrong because it fell the scope of the claims fell within section 3j now this is critical for us to understand uh, during the hearing the parties agreed that the main issue concerning legality of the patent on a construction of section 3j could be decided finally and if the answer as indicated earlier was in favor of monsanto the fact pertaining to the damages and injunctive relief may have gone may have to be gone into in the civil trial so the court says that both the parties agreed that the construction of section 3j could be decided finally and if the construction is in favor of monsanto the matter can go for trial parties also agreed that the issue of patentability can be urged on the basis of the material on record in the form of records before the single judge now there were 28 volumes of document the court notes that there were 28 volumes of document and that material was enough for the court to come to a conclusion now what was the issue here the issue was construction of section 3j so the court had framed the issue to say that let's construct the scope of section 3j and see whether the patent would fall within the scope of 3j if it fell within the scope of 3j then 
Monsanto would not be entitled to a patent for the invention under the Patents Act. Now, here from paragraph 59 onwards, the court starts its analysis and conclusions. Now, they are quite elaborate and uh, I would suggest that, you know, it requires a more detailed reading. So, we come to the final conclusions by the court. Now, the court considers various things. It considers uh, the European position. It considers various uh, how three the legislative history and the uh, obligations under various international agreements. And court concludes in 98. Thus, the exclusion of transgenic plants, what you find here, Thus, the exclusion of transgenic plants and seeds propagated after hybridization from patentability under Section 3J is congruent with the amendments of Article 53B of the European Patent Convention, wherein patents cannot be granted in respect of plants and animals exclusively obtained by means of essentially biological process. The conclusion of the court draws, therefore, is that transgenic plants with an integrated Bt trait produced by hybridization are excluded from patentability within the purview of Section 3J. Monsanto cannot assert patent rights over the gene that has thus been integrated into the generations of transgenic plants. Now, this is the court's finding. Now, the court also says there's another reason. The other reason why the court concludes that the Section 3J prohibits the grant of patents for BT trait is that variety is uh, induced variety is that they are part of seed. Now you'll recollect that section 3J has a reference to seeds. So it excludes seeds as well. So because there's a reference to seed there, the court comes to the conclusion that these are all uh, like without integration, they are inert and inanimate. And court comes that the process concludes that the process of hybridization taken up by Nuzi Video Group and BT cotton hybrid plants, as well as the seed produced there is, are squarely exempt from Section 3 of the Patents Act. And there is also a future propagation of transgenic plants. The court says that uh, that uh, the process of creation of such, such seeds would be excluded from patentability as they squarely fall within the meaning of essentially biological process. Again, Section 3J talks about essentially biological processes. So the court says even the process of creation of seeds would eventually also fall within that. So by that reason, it excludes or it applies Section 3J and says that Monsanto's patent rights and the process, so it includes, it says that the concern nucleotide sequence, for these reasons, it is held that the subject matter, the subject matter, the concern nucleotide sequence over, the Mons over which Monsanto has patent rights and the process is unpatentable. So they hold the product and the process to be unpatentable by reason of Section 3J. Then the court goes on to see, determine the application of the Plant Varieties Act, the PV Act. The court goes on and finally the court concludes and you have the court's conclusion here, conclusions. It holds that the subject patent fall within the exclusions spelt out in Section 3J of the Patents Act. The subject patent and the claims covered by it are consequently held to be unpatentable. Nuzi Vidu's counterclaim is therefore entitled to succeed and is consequently allowed. So what did the court do here? The court read the scope of Section 3J and found that the patent fell within the scope of Section 3J. And based on that, and this is what the court called a threshold analysis. Now, the, uh, I didn't uh, t take you through this part. Huh? Uh, this is, I mean, this is in paragraph 59. I should have brought you here uh, first. Now, at the outset, the court says, at the outset, this court proposes to examine only the threshold challenge to the patent and not carrying out an analysis of whether prima facie the patent granted or the claims thereunder lacked inventiveness, novelty, industrial application in view of the statement of the parties council. The court says that we are not looking at patentability, issues of patentability like 
inventiveness, novelty or industrial application, we are confining ourselves only to the threshold challenge and the threshold challenge is whether 3J is applicable or not. So this is what the court did. Now, and the court, as we saw here, finally, Uh, the court finally held that the patent fell within the scope of 3J and it allowed the counterclaim. Now, it did not allow the entire counterclaim because it only considered one aspect of the argument. Now, we will see whether towards the end, we will see whether the court was entitled to do that or whether that was something improper to do. And now we move to the Supreme Court's order. Yes, uh, we have the Supreme Court order here. So when the matter came before the Supreme Court, uh, there was quite a lot of issues before the bench and the judgment was given by Justice Naveen Sinha. Now, we will quickly look at some of the things that were considered. In paragraph 5, the court refers to the single judge order and mentions that the issues are writing out of the suit necessarily required formal proof, particularly expert opinion. So the court says that the, this is a matter that cannot be decided without pleadings being completed, evidence being adduced and seeking the opinion of experts. Again, uh, there are certain, what the single judge said that there are issues wherein complete and evidence is required and it should not be decided at the interim stage. So those arguments are reproduced here. And the fact that the single judge had issued notice to the counterclaim and there was no reply on the counterclaim. So all these uh, are mentioned in the Supreme Court's order. Uh, now, the fact that both plaintiffs and the defendants filed an appeal from the uh, preferred appeal, uh, the division bench dismissed the plaintiff's appeal upholding the defendant's contention with respect to the patent exclusion under Section 3J and the plaintiffs were at liberty to claim a registration under the Plant Varieties Act. Now, the in the arguments of the plaintiff, in paragraph 9, it is stated that the plaintiffs have never consented for a summary adjudication regarding the validity of its patent. Now, we saw that in the before the division bench, the parties had agreed to look at a threshold challenge by way of section 3J. So there was, the court clearly records that there is consensus from both the sides to see whether section 3J can be applied. So that is captured and it is mentioned in therein. But before the Supreme Court, the party, uh, the uh, plaintiffs state that they didn't uh, agree on a summary adjudication. Now the question, I mean, in my opinion, the conflict is whether there has been a summary adjudication, summary adjudication, because there are special provisions for uh, uh, getting a summary adjudication by the court, or whether this was, was with regard to a threshold issue. Now this is where I feel uh, the courts are at two different points, uh, the Supreme Court and the and the uh, and the single judge feel that uh, the matter is complex enough that it cannot there cannot be a summary adjudication and there cannot be a quick adjudication of this. Whereas the division bench takes a line that uh, there are certain threshold issues that can be decided and the division which took the consent of the parties and the parties agreed to it 
and the court decided that as a threshold issue. So the, the difference between the two courts is that whether this is summary adjudication or whether it was it pertained to deciding a threshold issue. And the court goes on further to note that and in paragraph 19, the court concludes its argument, uh, it, it summarizes its argument and say that we do not consider it necessary to deal with the same uh, at this stage and leave open all questions of facts and law. Now, the, what does the court say? The court just mentions here that though very elaborate submissions have been made with regard to facts and the technical process involved in the patent in question, the provisions of the Act, that's a Patents Act, PP. VFR, that's a Plant Varieties Act, and a large volume of case laws for construction of patents, the obligation of the WTO, G GATT, TRIPS, leading to the patents amendment in 2002, in view of the nature of the order proposed to be passed, the court says that in view of the order proposed to be passed, we do not consider it necessary to deal with the same. So quite a lot of the arguments that were passed was not necessary for passing this order. Now the court did not there is a passing reference to some of the arguments and the court in paragraph 22 states that manifestly the counterclaim of the defendant was not never considered by the learned single judge as only notice has been issued on the same. We see no reason to reject the uh, submission of so and so that it stands to reason why the plaintiffs would have consented to the summary adjudication of an existing pattern and risk losing the same without uh, any merit adjudication. Now again the issue that I find between the division bins understanding and the Supreme Court's view is that uh, was there a summary adjudication or was it deciding a threshold issue? Threshold issue on maintainability, threshold issue on jurisdiction. So uh, I take the view that the division bench I take the view that the division bench decided a uh, threshold issue and not and did not get into a summary adjudication. So these are two different things. If it's a threshold issue that if it's a threshold issue that is uh, that the court has decided, then the court is very well within its power to do that, and especially uh, especially when the court has to do the task of whether the jurisdiction of a particular act is applicable over another act. So the entire judgment, if you see, of the division bench was with regard to the first part of the judgment. The judgment had two parts. The first part was the subject matter of the patent would not fall under, uh, under the Patents Act in view of Section 3J. And the second part, the, the, the concluding part is it could fall within the purview of the Plant Varieties Act. So the division bench's entire order was not a summary adjudication. It was applying the jurisdictional filter in the Patents Act. Now, if you see, I mean, we have seen in our earlier classes as well, that Section 3 and Section 4 creates quite a lot of or many jurisdictional filters on the applicability of the Act itself. Now, now, those of you who have Section 3 in your hand, you can quickly take it and see that there are various jurisdictional filters that the Act gives. For instance, if we come to uh, Section 3O, Topography of Integrated circuited Circuits, excluded under the Act, but it's included under the Semiconductor Layout Act. Okay, uh, uh, Section 3L, Literary, Dramatic, Musical, Artistic Works, excluded under the Patents Act, included elsewhere, included under the Copyright Act. So 3J, when it comes to uh, exclusion of plants and animals in whole or any part thereof, other than microorganisms, but including seeds varieties, seeds excluded from the Patents Act, included in the Plant Varieties Act. So this is the scheme that you find that three, Section 3 also operates as a jurisdictional filter. So there is no need, if, if someone comes with a patent for a topography of integrated circuits, there is no need for the court to get into trial. There's no need for the court to adduce expert evidence. If the court, considering the arguments before it and the convenience and the uh, cooperation of the parties, comes to a conclusion that the applicable act 
with regard to topography of integrated circuits is the semiconductor chip layout act then it has to go there is no room here you cannot be in the patents act at all so this exercise is something which i refer to as applying the jurisdictional filter and i think that's a power that has to be given to the courts so that the courts take a call on which act is applicable so this would not fall under the view of a summary adjudication so that's one of my uh, submissions so the division bench therefore ought to have confined its adjudication to the question whether the grant of injunction was justified now the question is how can the court look only into the grant of injunction when there is a challenge to the patent and if the challenge is a valid challenge which says that the patent is non est it is not valid in law then will the court by granting an injunction the court will be upholding or passing an order based on a patent that ought not to have been granted in law so a jurisdictional challenge on the applicability of patent law should be considered even before you look at the interim stage itself but certain jurisdictional challenge may require detailed evidence so those are the issues that can only be decided post trial so the in such cases the option will be to expedite the trial and come out with a decision as soon as possible as it is possible for the parties to cooperate and do that so uh, the again the court says that the division bench ought to have examined the count, ought not to have examined the counter claim itself usurping the jurisdiction of the single judge to decide unpatentability of process claims summary adjudication of the technical complex requires expert evidence and the stage of impatentan was certainly neither desirable nor permissible in all so so again uh, the point of distinction between these two courts is that uh, the supreme court considers what the division bench did as a summary adjudication whereas the division bench clearly says that it was only a threshold challenge that was considered a purely threshold issue which in cases of maintainability in in issues with regard to jurisdiction in issue, issues which regard to which act will apply can be considered at the threshold stage itself and uh, and and the court concludes that we are therefore satisfied that the division been ought not to have disposed the suit in a summary manner again concluding that there has been su summary adjudication uh, uh, and extracted from and not even filed the exhibits much less examination saying that you didn't go through trial you shouldn't have done this and uh, so so what the supreme court did here it says that uh, it the division bench should have confined itself to the examination of validity of the order of injunction and uh, it upholds the single judge's order and it remands the matter back to the not to the division bench it remands it back to the single judge in order so that the case can be disposed of quickly now the the, the, the court says that uh, in lieu of the importance of the questions involved we expect the parties to cooperate and facilitate the single judge learned single judge in early disposal of the suit so it is remanded back to the single judge so uh, a jurisdictional issue or because section 3 is designed as a jurisdictional filter and we saw this in the novartis case as well and there is enough support in the novartis decision in the supreme court to say that uh, the, uh, the, the there are the decision in the novartis case followed up by decisions of the high court very clearly tells us that section 3 has to be raised at the outset so if there is a challenge based on section 3 you can take it at the outset which also tells us that it acts section 3 acts as a filter even before you consider the other things it could be it could be applied even before you consider the arguments on the other provisions so this tells us that if a court looks at a case wherein two different uh, 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 laws apply to say the copyright act and the patents act and if the court has to decide which act is applicable then that would be a uh, uh that would be a case where the court applies the jurisdictional filter and it can be considered as a threshold issue like a maintainability issue and it can be decided and that would not amount to in my humble submission to a summary adjudication now the other point that uh, that 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 we may have to uh, consider especially because we are uh, students of patent law is uh, the fact that the parties had agreed to something before the division bench there was consent recorded by the uh, by the bench 
and uh, that that they had agreed to see determine the scope of section 3j there was agreement which was clearly captured uh, and later on considering that you know there has been because the judge decided it because the outcome was in effect the they uh, the 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 plaintiff losing their patents and the the outcome so so when you agree on the 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 short point is when you agree on something before a court of law you should also be conscious about what could be the outcome so if you agree on applying the section 3j as a jurisdictional filter if you succeed yes the matter gets into trial but if you don't succeed it's quite likely that you will be ousted from the court or from the jurisdiction of the patents act and you may have to look at your remedies elsewhere so uh, there there are details to this but because the supreme court decision is actually based on a, a technical or a procedural ground they just said that the court should not have summarily decided this case uh, so so there is no scope for us to even the court has said that there are quite very important uh, issues involved and the court says that we are not given our finding on any other issue except for the fact that uh, the summary jurisdiction adjudication done by the revision bin ought not to have been there yes so uh, adjudication done by the revision bin ought not to have been there yeah if uh, y- you yes. so uh, So uh, you can type your questions if there are any you can use the chat and you can type your questions If there are any questions you can use the chat box and post your questions on the chat box Yes uh, um the court looked at the, there was in fact when the co- the case was argued there was quite a lot of details that were argued uh, with regard to whether dna is a chemical whether nucleic acid sequence uh, whether the scope of the patent uh, on the construction of the claims the court says that yes all these arguments were done but for us to decide this case there is no need for us to get into it the supreme court in fact it says that for us to decide this case we need not consider all those argument and the court says that here is a case where there has been a summary adjudication in the supreme court's opinion that was wrong and they send the case back to the uh, uh, to the single judge so which means now uh, two i mean this uh, single judge decision came in 2017 we had the division bench in 2018 and the supreme court in 2019 the supreme court has now we are back in the position in which we were in 2017 which means the s- single judge order stands and there uh, there there is no interim injunction in f- in favor of uh, monsanto and uh, the parties will have to comply with the directions issued by the single judge which is like uh, what 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 uh, the plaintiff referred to as a compulsory license and the parties will have to now expedite tri- trial because the court directs early disposal of the suit so the parties will have to expedite the trial so in effect uh this is uh, the supreme court has now sent the case back to the single judge and asked them to expedite the trial uh if the division bench order had been upheld 
then Monsanto would lose the patent. So because the division bin's order was undone, you could say that Monsanto's patent is still alive in that sense. Okay, the outcome, the, the court does not get into that. The court does not say whether the subject matter is, uh, is uh, comes within the jurisdiction of Patents Act or the Plant Varieties Act. The court doesn't do that. The court simply says that what uh, the exercise that the division bench did was incorrect. So it, it struck off the division bench order and it sent it back to the single judge. Okay, summary adjudication is where there is a issue that has to be decided and there is enough material before the court to decide that issue. For instance, uh, let me pull up the um, let me pull up the order of the hold on. Uh, Now, if you come to the order of the single judge, yeah. Now, again, we are having an issue here. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just give you the paragraph number so that you, you can follow that. Okay, uh, you, you have to look into paragraph 5 of the single judge's order. Yeah, we, we, we are having an issue that there is some uh, the, the system issue, so you won't be able to see the screen. So I'll just mention paragraph 5 just to explain this to, uh, to you. Uh, the court says that um, Uh, the court refers to the commercial courts, commercial division and commercial appellate division of the High Courts Act 2015, what is called the Commercial Courts Act, uh, jurisdiction, jurisdiction uh, where, where you can invoke the Commercial Courts Act jurisdiction. The court considers that and court says that both sides, however, were lukewarm to the suggestion for expeditious disposal of the main suit upon questions of law being addressed and adjudicated by recourse to a process of a special procedure of summary judgment. Now, summary judgment is under Order 13A of the CPC as legislated by the Co uh, Commercial Courts Act. So, a summary judgment uh, was not followed in this process. So, when you say summary adjudication, we understand summary adjudication as a, a term that is used in Order 13A of the Code of Civil Procedure. Now, people who are not lawyers in this group, then probably it'll be hard for you to understand. That's a procedural thing. There is a Code of Civil Procedure which, which has a special process procedure of summary judgment. So, summary judgment leads to a summary adjudication. So, there was a possibility, but the parties didn't agree to it, even before the single judge. When it came before the division bench, it was not the summary judgment. The parties again didn't agree because what they didn't agree before the uh, single judge, you can't say that they would have agreed it for before the division bench. We could we can assume that much of um, tact from the parties. What the parties did agree was let us consider Section 3J as a threshold issue. Let us understand. Let, the parties agree. I, I in fact read the relevant portions. So there is a difference between an issue of maintainability which sometimes, if when it's decided, may dispose the case in full. You, you may end up losing your patent. And there is a difference between a summary judgment under Order 13A of the CPC. Now, this was the distinction that I wanted to bring. Uh, there is no economic, uh, the, the economic impact of the order is this, that they are in the position in which they were when the single judge passed the order. They go back to 2017. That's it. I mean, uh, the, the, the time they've spent in the courts, obviously that is a thing, but but I, I would uh, I would expect that, you know, the uh, parties would have learned quite a lot in the process. Uh, and, and, and I would even expect the trial to get over quickly because there's quite a lot of preparation that has gone. 
uh, we don't know we don't know because uh, because that will be the subject matter that the single judge will have to now decide okay we have we can uh, we can share the links uh, all these orders are available in the respective court websites you can also check them on indian kanun that's a website where you can search for the orders you can just type the name of the cases and you will find these orders on indian kanun okay so so we'll conclude this section and thanks for joining us